All right, so uh, thanks everyone for coming. As you know, UK SPS is a, a, a UK-wide cybersecurity and privacy seminar series. And uh, uh, it's more than 20, it's, it's a collaboration between more than 20 universities. And uh, for example, today we have uh, speakers from Surrey. Um, and uh, if you go to our uh, website, uh, UK SPS, dash sps.org uh, you'll have a range of different ways to to sort of uh, follow the talks uh, um, there's uh, there's a twitter account there's the, the website there's the calendar that you can subscribe to um, and the talks are uh, recorded and shared later if the um, if the author if the speakers agree and also live streamed on on um, on youtube uh and uh, one last thing um we are recording the talk today so if you don't want to sort of if you don't want your uh, voice or face to be to appear you know what to do at the end we will uh sort of provide an opportunity for off the record questions uh, so we will stop the recording and provide an opportunity uh, for off the record questions with that I'll invite uh, Catalin, the, the host of our uh, talk today, uh, to introduce the speaker. If, uh, thank you, Sia. Okay, so um, obviously you can start to see the first slide. So we have Iwana Bogranu. She is a senior lecturer at the University of Surrey, where she is also on Royal Society Liver from Fellowship. Um, her main interests are formal verification and uh, cryptographic proofs for different secure systems especially in the context of authenticated key exchange, proximity checking, and uh, payment systems. She also acts as a PI on several EPSRC, NCIS, and Royal Society funded projects, uh, where she's most interested in new tools for privacy and um, security verification. And also you want us uh, the deputy director for the service NCSC certify and this is where I have to read because I keep making mistakes, Academic Center of Cybersecurity Research and Education. Uh, sorry, and you wanna? Welcome to start. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, Katalin, thank you for the introduction. Sia, thank you for the invitation. Um, yes, that's me. The title of the talk is here, but what I'd like to add as well is that this talk is very much based on uh, joint work <clears throat> amongst all the people mentioned on this uh, slide, main, mainly, sorry, namely Andrea Inaradu, Tom Chotia from University of Birmingham and from University of Surrey, Chris Newton and Li Chun Chen. Okay, so, um, oops, okay. So in fact, we are all um, five of us uh, from a project that is called Time Trust. And this is a project that is uh, still running. It's been running for two years and a bit under the Research Institute in Secure Hardware and Embedded Systems, um, which is an institute funded by EPSRC and uh, NCSC. And uh, without their funding, we probably wouldn't have been done all of this research. And this is the, the five of us involved in this research. In this research, <laughs> in, directly or indirectly at different points, we involved our partners in the project, uh, and particularly we involved Visa and MasterCard, as you would see, but we have other partners in, in this project that were instrumental in some of our research. Okay, so this is the, the structure of my talk, and um, while Scatalin didn't say, you can interrupt me throughout the talk to ask questions. Um, however, if it's in the chat or things like this, I might not see it. Um, so maybe just pick up if you think it's really urgent or I will in any case, in case answer all the questions at the end. So we're going to see some overview in uh, EMV payments. We're going to show you an uh, Apple and Visa attacks so or an attack that is possible in uh, contactless payments when you use your Apple Pay um, a system, so your iPhone and use a Visa card underneath. We're going to show you some uh, countermeasures of how to stop this attack. 
in some aspects of formal security uh, linked to this attack, as per uh, the title of the talk and the invitation said, most of it is practical or explains this how we've done it in practice and what's, uh, how this attack works in practice. And uh, some of it uh, will go into some formal verification aspects and we'll conclude at the end. Okay, so we'll start with an introduction in EMV payments and contactless payments. So before uh, speaking about contactless payments, I'd like to tell you what EMV stands for. So, um, well, when we say EMV, we mean uh, generally uh, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, but in AMV Co is the body that standardizes payments as we know them, pay payments done with a card. Um, and this started a long time ago, as you know, with uh, magnetic uh, strip cards. Then from there, we moved to uh, chip and pin cards from chip and pin cards where the, the chip on the card uh, uh, was a contact chip. So you had to put it inside the terminal. Then we moved to contactless. Then from contactless, <laughs> we moved even to using contactless, not just in traditional uh, terminals, but in 2014, this was introduced, for example, for um, a transport system. So you would use a normal card, bank card, as you would have used your Oyster card in London. Since 2014, we moved to even having terminals that are not the traditional brick and mortar terminal, but other types of terminals that take uh, contactless and contact payments. And finally, uh, even more recently than that, uh, we've now are able to pay not just with cards, but with all sorts of uh, devices that underneath use uh, the details of a card, be it a phone, a watch, and so forth. And so if I were to po pause and look there's something in the chat, so maybe it's a, it's a question. Uh, oh, no, it's not a question. But I could ask you, uh, having looked at that, what is different in this? Well, I won't ask you what's different in this, but I will tell you that what's different amongst all of this clearly was the, the uh, common denominator difference is the fact that there are different verification methods, so-called cardholder verification method, methods or CVMs. So here you'd have had signature, a weak sort of verification. Here you'd have your pin, your number to, 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 to put in. Here, well, in the contactless setting, you would hardly have much verification, but actually there is something called tap and pin where you tap in some countries. And uh, after you tap, if the payment is above the limit, <laughs> you're still being asked for a pin. <clears throat> and What's interesting is that in this case is you would have what's called a customer uh, uh, device cardholder verification method or CDCVM. So what this means is that um, what this means is that um, in this case you will uh, have the verification done uh, potentially on your device on your mobile phone rather than at the POS at the point of sale at the terminal. So this is a, a brief overview of how EMV payments. Um, <clears throat> Uh, transitioned over the time, but it's always the same protocols, more or less, with additions and additions and additions standardized by this uh, body called EMV Co. Okay, so it is in this space that we're going to have a talk today. And in order to show you, uh, to explain some of the talk, I'm going to first give you an overview of how this EMV protocol actually works. So <laughs> this schema that I have in here is based more on the Visa protocol than on the MasterCard protocol. Um, the protocols are very similar. They have some uh, differences. And throughout uh, uh, my talk, I'm going to uh, speak mostly of the Visa one. And if you're interested at the end, I will explain more on the MasterCard one. So you have a card and you have a point of sale and you have a, a bank or an issuer of this card. This is the bank that's the, the, the issuer bank, the, 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 the bank that issued this card, as opposed to some other banks that, for example, take the payment and so on. Okay, so um, your bank card would share a long term symmetric key with the, uh, uh, with the bank, this KM. So everything that's shared with the bank in this slide is in red. So you would share a key with the bank, your card would share a key with the bank. And the card would also come shipped with. <laughs> a public key uh, a pair, a symmetric, uh, a secret key and a public key that's on the card and the public key is certified with a certificate signed by this issuing bank. And the way the protocol roughly works is at the beginning, there's a negotiation whereby 
uh, the, the reader in the card would uh, agree what protocol is going to be run. So whereas be a Visa or a MasterCard protocol uh, run in here, the so-called application or type of card as I called it in here. The terminal would issue at a, a random number or nonce, and then would also, you know, charge for some amount and some currency and so on. And it would ask you in, in another message to pay. This is the so-called GenAC or generate uh, application cryptogram, if you want to speak in this protocol term, uh, terms uh, command, but basically it means pay. And in this payment uh, uh, command, it sends this data that it generated in here, the nonce, the amount that it wants you to pay. Your card would process that, would generate itself a nonce. <coughs> and the card has a transaction counter, so the number of times that you paid by. And based on that transaction counter on this key that it only shares with the bank, it uh, generates a session key that it's then used to produce a MAC. And this MAC is basically, if you want, uh, the payment data that goes to the bank. And as it's written in here, it's in red. So this, this can be only uh, consumed by the bank since it's based on secret uh, keys that are, that are um, held uh, between you and the bank. And so this is gen the card is generating this data, this cryptogram, this AC. It's also generating a similar type of information that is uh, called SDAD. <clears throat> and this dynamic data in here, it's a signature that is to be consumed by the terminal. So it's in blue, so it's to be consum consumed by the terminal. And um, <clears throat> uh, it's a signature basically that the card would, uh, would produce and the reader would verify based on the certificate that it will be sent and it will extract the public key of the card of the certificate and verify the signature. And so this would go to, uh, to the uh, terminal. Now, the terminal can be so-called in offline mode, we say in EMV terms, and uh, it can gen then verify directly this, um, <clears throat> this signature. And if all the data coincides with what it thinks it's been running so far in this transaction, it would be happy. And uh, that offline terminal will uh, finish the transaction. If the terminal is online, on the other hand, that is, is connected online to a bank, would send the transaction data, so for this AC, along with other data that I won't put in here in this simplified version. And uh, it will wait for an authorization from the bank. So the bank will verify this AC and it will, will wait for authorization. Uh, we send them to the authorization. Yes, they, these people have the money to pay or not. So this is how the EMV protocol works. <clears throat> I will stop for a second and ask if there's any question at this point, though you do not need any more details. Don't worry about the fact that there are lots of dots in here. Just I, ideally, you should understand the uh, general gist of the transaction. I do have a quick question. So it's between the bank and the <coughs> device. Uh, do they generally the device uh, communicate directly to the bank or do it sometimes wait? Like, do they collect a lot of transactions at the end of the day? They this, check? this one, yes. So, yes. so if it's an offline terminal, for example, it won't con contact the bank. So as I, as I said, an offline terminal would sort of not do this bit in here. It will just verify the signature from the card and would stop. Whereas an online terminal, the most of them are online. Like you see people around shops running around to find signal will send this data to the bank there and then and wait for authorization. Others and batches of things uh, later on at the end of uh, the day or the end of the week. Okay, thanks. Uh, what's the AC, ATC, someone says ATC, oops, sorry. ATC stands for transaction counter. So this is a, how many times you have done, this is how many times you have done a transaction. Uh, with your cards, so one time, two times, three times. This is uh, something that uh, should be synchronized between you and the bank. I synchronize the points. Okay, so I'll carry on and uh, then tell you that that's how the protocol looks on the sketch. But in real life, what this protocol is, this is a uh, um, <clears throat> between your card, uh, uh, your card and the reader is a actual. Uh, a radio frequency protocol, RFID protocol. Uh, and uh, what is sent in between the two of them is what's called application protocol data units. This is a standard, I think um, ISO 7816 or something like this for uh, um, 
for radio transactions. So actually they're bytes between uh, a series of uh, command response between the card and the reader and application, uh, uh, EMV application makes sense of these bytes in particular ways that would mean, for example, that GenAC command with different fields inside it. How we can see this in real life, for example, well, we can put a sniffer in between the, um, the terminal and the card. And one of the sniffers would be um, what we're using in here is, or in this research, we use the Proxmark. This is a well-known RFID um, uh, research tool. Um, I was this one that's uh, pictured in here. It's um, uh, version three, uh, Proxmark three, revision four. Um, and this one that's pictured in here is uh, my one with a Bluetooth uh, connector on it, uh, mounted here on top. It's all the same, but basically with this one, you can sniff and record and you, you would sniff what you would sniff, you would sniff things like this. And you would get this sort of, uh, um, <clears throat> this sort of uh, bytes. So if I were to open this, so this is a, a transaction I did myself with a Visa card, what I see in here between my Visa card, uh, my Revolut Visa card and the reader is um, precisely uh, this APDUs. And what we did in this research, we have several scripts, sorry, this is not opening, several scripts. And in the scripts that we, we wrote and, um, and in main part and they are wrote and improved and improved, we make sense of these bytes to understand EMV commands, to understand what's being sent and what each, uh, well, not literally each, but pretty much each byte in here or series of bytes in here are an EMV field and we make sense of that. And we understand this by, uh, in general, a lot of our uh, understanding was informed by looking at traces and traces of EMV and understanding the protocol, not just from the specification, but understanding the protocol <clears throat> understanding the protocol uh, in real life. Okay, so this is how we inform our research. So we look at traces and traces in, in lab conditions, we do transactions ourselves with one of these and so on, and we read specifications and we look at this and we see what's happening in, in these transactions. Okay, so um, I will continue. Oops, that is if this works. And I will now go to, explain to you the protocol in more detail. What I mean in more detail is in details that are relevant to us, to us in this sort of attack. So um, I can't explain the whole protocol in the time that we have, but I will explain what's really relevant. Okay, so I will select some of the so-called EMV fields. You already see in here that I have more of these commands, uh, card, uh, reader um, card response, reader, um, RAPDU, card APDU, and I will select some information and detail it to you. Okay, so the <laughs> one that I'm detailing first is this TTQ written in here. This is uh, EMV Lingo, it stands for Terminal Transaction Quantifier, and you want to know all the details in that. Uh, in, in one of this terminal transaction quantifier, but basically this is how the card informs the, uh, the sorry, how the reader informs the card of what it, it wants. So for example, it would say, I'm one of those online or offline readers um, in the way that Catalin asked. So I'm waiting for an SDAD at the end, one of these signatures to check or not. If I'm offline, I'm waiting for one. If I'm online, I might not get one. I require that you do a customer validation you remember from my slide customer validation method. So there is a, a, a certain particular uh, byte uh, two in here, bit seven, that would say, uh, I want you to do authentication, for example, because the transaction value is above a hundred pounds in the UK and I want you to do this. Or it has another special and to us important, um, important byte um, um, that says that, um, actually a bit in a byte, uh, byte one, bit one, that says that I'm a special type of terminal. I am online connected to the bank, but I also want you to send me an SDAD because I might have, for example, intermittent connection. And that is transport terminals. Like for example, we can equate this bit in here to meaning, to, to meaning transport terminals. So it means transport for London will operate in this way. There might be other terminals that operate in, in this one, not just transport terminals, but transport terminals for effect operate in this way. 
Okay, so uh, they are um, prepared to contact the bank, but please send me one of these signatures. This is what it's saying. Okay, so these are important because they, the reader informs the card of uh, things that it's ones that are authenticating SDADs, whether you do authentication on the device or not, whether you, you're required to do authentication, sorry, not on the device, if you're required to do authentication or not, if uh, other modes of operation of the terminal. Another bit, another EMV field that is important is this AIP. This AIP is, uh, stands for Application Interchange. Sorry, Ivana, sorry to interrupt. I think there's an issue. What is the issue? I couldn't understand clearly. Was it just my... Sorry, no, it's okay. What's the issue? Okay, sorry. sorry to I, I couldn't understand either. So it, it seems like an internet problem or something. Okay, yes. so where should I say again? The TTQ, did you understand roughly that yeah, this TTQ yes, is yes. a field that is important because the reader tells the card what sort of authentication data it expects. If it has to do, if the, uh, the uh, customer has to do, for example, input a PIN or not, if it operates in certain modes requiring uh, one of these uh, later on requiring a signature sent from the card or not. Okay. Is this okay now? Yes. Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. Good. So the other one that is important is AIP. AIP is important in, in the sense that it, it stands for doesn't matter what stands for application interchange profile, but it it's something that is static on the card. It comes with the card and it tells it tells the capabilities of the card. For example, I'm a card that can do authentication or not. Maybe there's some more a device or something that can do authentication uh, or not. Um, then the important one is this one, CTQ, where the card responds with what is called uh, card transaction qualifiers. And it is a series of bytes. And in one of these bytes, what is important to us, there is a bit, a particular bit that says that there was, for example, at this stage of the protocol, there was authentication done on the device. So for example, on a device, what would it mean if this was inside a mobile phone that you've inputted uh, you've, you've put in your finger for a fingerprint or you did face ID, that you did authentication on the device. This, there will be a bit in here, at this stage of the protocol that would inform the terminal that this happened. What is also important uh, in this is this part in here, this part in here, which stands for, um, which stands for issuer application uh, data. And this one that stands for issuer application, application data is something that the bank, so here, the bank would get or the uh, issuer itself, the payment networks, the visa, the MasterCard would get uh, and would check this data, would have uh, the necessary secret key, for example, the bank would have that KM that I said to check this information to, um, to, to, to check the information in the transaction against fraud. So it would be a view of the transaction that the bank would get with lots of details potentially inside, uh, including things like uh, if customer did uh, validation and it passed or it didn't pass, if it was um, a plastic uh, card, if it was a mobile card, this sort of information would get to the back end of the network and would be readable or uh, the authentication uh, would be uh, only possible at, at, at that back end of the network. What's also important is that if the reader sends something to the bank, uh, well, in the side where the reader sends, um, uh, sends information to the uh, bank, when it says information to the bank, either online immediately or later on, it sends also on that uh, back end network one aspect that's called MCC, one field that's called MCC, uh, merchant, um, merchant code, merchant. Um, it escapes me now. Much of something code, uh, qualifier code. No, it's not, doesn't sound right. Um, this merchant code basically is a code like this code in here that says to the uh, backend network that this reader in here is a reader that's registered with a certain type of, uh, of provision. So for example, it will be transport and it will be local transport or it will be bus lines or it will be certain retail type things. Uh, so these are codes that uh, tell to the backend network wh whom um, took the transaction, roughly speaking, which group of readers this belonged to. 
Okay, so this is the protocol like before, and there's some authenticating data, as I said, whether the customer did authentication, didn't do, sent in here, the, what the card is capable of, what the terminal would want from the card, what uh, data the bank gets that's important, this one that's certified by the card, but also information from the reader, such as the merchant category code, came to me, merchant category code. Okay, so... Um, for what I mean to say next is that as far as we're concerned, if we're looking between the card uh, and the reader, uh, the card, a card, a plastic card doing the transaction or a mobile device, your mobile phone doing a transaction are almost identical. When I say almost, there are some things that would tell them apart, really, if the reader were to look, but with, for most intensive purposes, they are almost identical transactions. But they're not identical transactions uh, between a card, a, a transaction done with a plastic card and a transaction done with a mobile phone when it comes to the issuer, when it comes to the bank, because the bank gets that uh, IA, IAD that I told you about issuer application data. And that one would tell the difference, as I said in my previous slide, whether the transaction is done by plastic or mobile. So by receiving this information over here, the bank or the issuers will be able to tell the difference between a plastic card here and a mobile card. A reader could hardly do that. A reader with some smart logic could. Okay. Merchant category code, apparently. Yes, someone told me. Yes, yes. Right. Um, it is merchant category code. So going back to, to this uh, slide in here, so the the transactions are uh, distinguishable uh, or by the by the backend network, whether it's between a card and a reader, and what is in whether it is between a card or a mobile phone doing the transaction. And what is very important about mobile phones is that mobile phones these days also have what I say here operation modes. So this is a, a screenshot from my Samsung Pay, and you will see in here that I have payment cards as well as transport cards, and you will see in in here that one of my cards is marked as transport card, if you read in here. If you go and look about Apple, you would see that Apple also has something called express travel mode. It might have changed its name since to something else. Uh, but this particular, this particular uh, modes are modes in which you set certain cards in your mobile uh, app, payment app, to be used, this transport modes and this express travel modes to be used with, with travel or transport terminals, so the likes of Transport for London. And what is important in this slide in here is that these sort of operation modes, call them retail mode and transport mode for mobile phones, are even those distinguish distinguishable amongst themselves by the issuer via that IAD. So if I go back in here in my slides, when this information is sent to the bank down here, the bank would be able looking at that to know whether this has been a, a plastic card or a mobile phone and the mobile phone in transport mode or in non-transport mode. Not particularly like that, but it will be able to entail that type of information by looking carefully at the information inside this IAD. Where a reader is virtually none the wiser with, unless they implement a specific logic in the application, um, that they would be seeing a card or seeing a, a mobile uh, uh, card emulator in here. Okay, so, so what do we have in here in terms of authentication, plastic and mobile and contactless payments? So we're speaking contactless payments. And if we have plastic, in general, if it's under a hundred pounds you, in the UK now, I'm speaking UK, it might be a different value in Europe, I don't know, 150 euros uh, in uh, um, several transactions, so I don't, I don't know what's in, in, in mainland Europe. Uh, but basically in the UK, uh, if it's under 100 pounds, you don't need authentication. If it's over 100 pounds, you could start contactlessly, and in some countries, in uh, in depending if your country, uh, your card was issued in, say, Switzerland, France, Romania, and some other cards, and you try to pay here, for example, in uh, in the UK with that card, and you start you start contactlessly, uh, it might still ask you for what I call the chip and pin, in the sense that the transaction will continue and it will 
then ask you to put a pin into the terminal as opposed to a UK card, for example, would not behave in this way. You would have to put your card inside the terminal to begin with to do a transaction ab above the value. It would not start a contactless transaction if the value was above uh, a certain limit. Um, right. And then, so if we're looking at the mobile uh, spectrum, in the mobile spectrum, we have, for example, I, uh, I'm only speaking about Samsung Pay and Apple Pay here, and they have this uh, retail modes and they have their transport modes. And what, what is happening is that in the retail world, so if you pay to everyone else other than a transport terminal, you need to authenticate all the time. So if you use Samsung Pay or Apple Pay, you need to put a fingerprint on to the phone to unlock the phone to do a transaction with Samsung Pay, or you need to do a face ID recognition for uh, Apple Pay to do uh, a, a transaction if you are in retail mode. If you are in transport mode, on the other hand, so that it is usable, so that you can go through the gates in London without having to look at your phone or put your fingerprint on the screen, you don't have to do authentication. Whether, and that is true, whether you're taking a transaction above the limit or under the limit in the transport mode, I, I would discuss this later because transaction over the limit in transport mode might not make sense everywhere, but some of them might exist. For example, you might pay for a very expensive ticket to go uh, somewhere and might be uh, above a hundred pounds to go from here to York uh, by train. Uh, whether this, oops, I don't know what happened there. Whether there is a question mark in here on my slides, we'll go back to this question like a uh, mark a bit later about Samsung Pay in transport mode and above the limit values and so on and so forth. Um, but in general, you do not need authentication. That's what you need to re uh, remember. If you are in transport mode, you don't need authentication on your mobile uh, devices for usability purposes. If you are in any other mode, whether it's above the limit or under the limit, you do need to authenticate and unlock your phone before you do a transaction. Okay, so the idea in this talk and in general in the work that we did is, okay, so we have this spectrum in here between um, authentication, authentication, chip and pin, trans transport mode, not transport mode, particularly, can we abuse this fact? Can we somehow make an illicit payment, let's call it, whereby we abuse the uh, fact that uh, in transport mode, you do not need authentication and can we, cheat and make somehow a pay, uh, a terminal uh, think it, uh, a card think it's operating in transport mode when it's not in transport mode and make a payment that we're not supposed to be making. So this is what we wanted to test. We wanted to test that this if this usability feature for mobile uh, payments can be abused to take payments without authentication when you would need authentication. Okay, so we started to investigate. So when we started to investigate, we needed to get some transport uh, transaction data. So we needed to get some transport transaction data. So uh, some of us went um, <clears throat> and tried to collect data as the slide is saying, first we did some data collection. And so how did we do the data collection? We used our own phones, our own uh, money, our own uh, cards, and one of this transport, one of this uh, RFID, uh, equipment that I mentioned earlier, a proxmark to sniff the transaction. So we sniffed the transaction and then we uh, looked at the transaction, recorded that uh, uh, transaction in the proxmark and saved it and looked at them and looked at them. The first thing that we noticed was that in this transport mode, there was an unusual series of bytes that we dubbed the magic bytes that were appearing before the NFC protocol started. So before even before you go to EMV, EMV, to the payment protocol, you do the NFC, the RFID protocol. And before the NFC even started, you'd have this magic bytes appearing. Uh, call them magic bytes for now. We call them magic bytes. In, even the paper will call them magic bytes. We didn't know why they were because they didn't correspond to any protocol that should be running in here. So they didn't correspond to the RFID protocol or the EMV protocol. They were appearing in transport transactions. So that we observed, we took several transactions, MasterCard, Visa, Apple phone, um, Samsung phone, different things. And then if we wanted to test our um, hypothesis to see if we can do this uh, authentication abuse and lead to uh, illicit payments, first of all, we would have needed 
to try and pretend that we're transport for London. So this attack of a view number one slide is us having here, for example, an iPhone and a proxmark in here that this time is going to try and pretend as written in here that it is transport for London. So it will replay, for example, those magic bytes, but at the same time, we will be uh, sending to it information that we want to be sending potentially from uh, um, communicating at the same time with another terminal and presenting some information here. So it will emulate a terminal to this uh, iPhone pretending to be transport for London, potentially with some data changed uh, in this, in this uh, pretense uh, transaction. Meanwhile, at this other end, we would have a real terminal, for example, and one of these um, uh, terminals that we have, the IZs, the sum ups, the so on and so forth, uh, modern terminals that we all in this project have. And we will try to start making a transaction in here. And here we'll have another phone, a card emulator, call it, that would uh, uh, pretend to be making a transaction here, in fact, be making a transaction here, but data from this. Uh, uh, of this card emulator in here would if, in fact be uh, coming from the iPhone in here. So this would be emulating the iPhone the, and the Proxmark would be emulating this EMV reader in a sense to here, but not entirely, some of its transaction, meanwhile pretending to be transport for London. Of course, this is not enough. This attack overview is not enough. This has been uh, uh, known for quite some time. This is sort of a, a, a relay transaction. And for example, Tom, who's in this uh, call, Tom Chotia, who, and who's also uh, a partner in this project and uh, uh, one of the uh, 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 co-authors of this work, is done uh, relay type attacks of this type from 2015 in payments. But what we also needed in here was a bit more. We needed a new type of communication inside this relay <clears throat> between the uh, card emulator and the Proxmart as a reader emulator. We needed new uh, scripts, a new logic, new server logic um, in the communication. This is all wireless communication, by the way, uh, <coughs> that would change authentication data that we're interested in changing in such a way that we do the we test it if we can do the trick that I um, alluded to, the trick in which um, we change authenticating the data back and forth such that we can do a fraudulent transaction pretending to have done authentication when we haven't done authentication. So let's see how the attack actually works. So this is um, <clears throat> in the slide in here. So we have our attack setup that I've described earlier. And so we start the protocol. Um, this one pretends to be transport for London, as I said in here, sends the magic bytes. This one is a normal transaction that I start on my IZ. I put a value, um, say the value is above the um, above the um, above the uh, contactless limit in the UK. And so uh, I um, I continue the transaction uh, and I uh, relay information. The important thing is that now this card, this uh, this uh, reader here, will send some information to this card in here. I this card emulation, which is ours, this is a phone that is ours. Okay, will send it through to the victim's phone, to the iPhone. The iPhone is locked at this point. It's thinking, it's speaking to Transport for London because it's consumed the magic bytes. So what we have in here to do, we have to flip information, flip bits, change information inside those uh, terminal and transaction qualifiers, these TTQs, to say, for example, that in here, I want now to uh, you to, to pay for the amounts that are in here, but also that I want to change information such that this maps to an online with offline information uh, in, uh, in terms of terminals, because as I said, the terminals for Transport for London operate in that particular mode online with offline. So we need to flip that bit to make the iPhone believe it is speaking to a terminal indeed that is in that mode um, online with offline. And so the iPhone would continue to be locked, believing to speak to be speaking to Transport for London, having received the correct information from the terminal, would reply 
and would send all the information as for a transport for lambda terminal, including this um, a signature, for example, that is needed for transport for London and, and all the other data that's necessary. Now, when the information comes back to us in the relay logic, we have to change it in that uh, with the script that we have, and we have to, to change information in here and to tell this terminal, for example, that uh, authentication has been done on the device. Of course, this device hasn't done any authentication because this device was locked and was speaking to transport for London. So inside here, it wouldn't have said that it did authentication, but we have to trick this particular reader into believing that authentication on the device has been done. So we have to flip some information inside this particular field, the uh, CTQ field, and tell the reader that this is the case. And then we continue. You can my notice that in here we I we changed we, we do change some other things they're not absolutely necessary but for example this terminal is online with offline so to receive a signature this one is a real online terminal so it doesn't care for this signature so we drop the signature therefore we drop some certificates in here so this information is slightly smaller than this information but the important bits that we change are the ones that are marked in red so mainly the ones that are uh, um, the terminal here says that it is an online with offline terminal and here we lie about authentication having been done on the device when in fact this device hasn't done authentication. So we pay with money from a locked iPhone that thinks it's paying to transport for London to an iZettle here in uh, potentially in, in, in Surrey or in Birmingham that is uh, taking a transaction thinking it's speaking to someone else but the transaction data comes from that phone. So this data comes that goes all the way to here comes from that phone there. Okay, so what is important is that in the particular instantiation that we're interested in is an over the limit attack. So this is an attack in which in here the amount would be above the limit. What is also important is that we need to flip, as I said, this information to, be, to make Apple believe it's speaking to a terminal that's a transport terminal. That the card in here is the iPhone believes is speaking to transport for London. So this will say that I, I haven't done authentication. That here we do say that I have done authentication on the device. And this for all intents and purposes for the, uh, the um, efficiency of the script can be cached. This is information that can be cached. Okay, so this is our attack. This is what we flip. So we flip the t for over the limit. We flip this to this side and we flip this to this side. Flip information means changing certain, certain bits inside the fields of those APDU bytes that you saw. I invite you to go to this website in here and see on this website in here, see the um, uh, see our attacks live. You can see also live meaning in a video. Uh, and you can see an over the limit attack. You can also see an under the limit attack and you can see how it works. Okay, so I will um, tell you also that uh, um, what is important that was not marked in red on my previous slide. So everything that was important on my previous slide was marked in red. So where we intervene and this attack becomes a, an active man in the middle attack as opposed to a simple relay attack. But what's also important to the attack, other important EMV fields are this one that I insisted upon earlier. So the one that the bank will get the um, issuer application data on the card that comes from the, on the side that comes from the iPhone. This will say that I'm an iPhone, I'm locked and I'm speaking to Transport for London therefore implicitly. It won't say all that, but it will contain enough information, information to entail that. And this we do not change going forward to the to our iZettle. And then if it, when the iZettle sends it forward to the bank, it won't change. Even if we try to change it, we couldn't because this is authenticated data and we can't change it. But this one says I haven't done authentication on this side. So it goes all the way like that saying that I haven't done authentication. This is what my slide says. What is also important in here to notice is that when our iZettle uh, reader sends information to the bank, it will also say some MCC, uh, some merchant category code that says I'm registered to su such and such type of business. And probably that type of business won't have anything to do with Transport for London. 
And uh, what is also important and is not mentioned anywhere in my previous slides is that, well, in here, there's a transaction value that uh, I said is over a limit transaction, and that's sent to, uh, to the iPhone as coming from Transport for London. So an important piece of information is value of transactions in, in transport modes. So if you think about our attack, about which authenticating get data, authenticating data or customer validation data or customer device or, or validation data goes where and what uh, other important informations they are, like transaction value, merchant category code, this is all encapsulated or recapped onto this slide. Okay, so um, I apparently have, uh, I'm running uh, short of time, but I think we've also started a bit a bit late so i mean we haven't started at o'clock so i'll go for another five minutes before uh, i uh, break for questions so <clears throat> in uh the previous slide i also told you uh, some details about this um, um iad so what the bank gets what the back end gets what visa mastercard your issuer bank gets at the end of at, 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 at the back end of the network this ID that I said at the beginning was used for anti-fraud uh, methods, for anti-fraud protection. And so if you look at that ID, which is something that um, uh, we try to look, it's proprietary specs for Visa, but um, we spoke to Visa, which is a partner in this project, and the reverse engineer as much as we could, uh, by that meaning Andrea reverse engineer as much as, uh, as she could, we can actually know that some part uh, of the, so first of all, IDs have formats, so it would be different for, for mobile than it is for plastic. And oops. And also there will be a part in here, a CVR byte one that uh, we've been told by Visa, CVR stands for customer validation results. So the result of the customer doing validation on the device. Um, this, this byte in here contains information that will say whether I've been Apple and I've done authentication, where I've been Apple and I haven't done authentication, Google and I've done authentication, uh, Samsung Pay and I haven't done authentication, Samsung Pay and I have done authentication. So there is a particular byte inside here that gives you enough information for you to entail that, <clears throat> for the uh, issuers to entail, for Visa to entail that uh, what type of device did that transaction and in which context, in which mode. Okay, so what else did we do? So we tried this with a variety of things. So with a variety of, of, um, of um, uh, readers or uh, terminals at our end, and we've tried uh, with, uh, with a variety of phones, so Samsung phones, Apple phones, and various methods. And in terms of emulator, so the one that was uh, being uh, pretending to make the payment to these terminals, we've tried with, uh, well, we've tried with many phones, actually not just this is an example, we've tried the Samsung phones. We've tried a variety of combinations, Samsung Pay, Apple Pay, Visa cards, MasterCards. I've only spoken to you about Visa cards, but we've tried all these different combinations. And all that happens in here is that the attack that I presented to you literally only works in the combination for Apple Pay with Visa. The attacks don't work under the limit or above the limit for MasterCard or for Samsung. And in the amount that I've got, I will say why that is. It will become clear from the countermeasures that we proposed and we've discussed with Apple and Visa. And those countermeasures are implemented either by Samsung or by MasterCard in or in combination, a combination thereof. And you'll understand why uh, that doesn't work in other cases and it does work for Apple and for Visa in their combination. So to understand the easy countermeasures, I will have to uh, remind you of this slide. I won't go through the slide again, but basically Visa could check that ID, that information that tells you what type of device, if in authentication mode, not in authentication mode, did the transaction. It doesn't say it as such, but you can entail it from a given byte one that of the CVR that's encoded in there. The format would also tell you if you're plastic card, up, uh, mobile card, a mobile device and so on. It can check the merchant category code and therefore it can tell 
that actually that transaction is not is uh, that is happening in there doesn't match up with the uh, ID either because the merchant category code in, in our transaction that uh, Visa would receive would be not transport for London. And actually MasterCard checks all of this and MasterCard checks the ID, checks the, uh, checks the merchant category codes and that's why the attacks doesn't the attacks don't work for MasterCard. <clears throat> Another countermeasure would be that in transport mode, I can not here present a high value transaction, that I can only present a low value transaction, or even better, that I can only present a zero value payment and later on settle with the banks in the way that some uh, Oyster card uh, transactions used to work. And this is the Samsung Pay case. This is why we can't attack Samsung Pay. Because Samsung Pay here, if it speaks to a transport terminal, would this is Samsung Pay here, will not accept us saying pay me 150 pounds or um, 200 pounds or 1,000 pounds like in the attacks that we have, um, because it only accepts zero. Another way is to deploy relay protection mechanisms. So in fact, MasterCard has a standardized protocol since 2017 that would <clears throat> protect against a uh, relay. So what it would mean, it would mean that in here, what we do, probably we add some time to the transaction and by add, not probably surely, by doing this relay in here. And so this transaction would be faster without the relaying from here to here. And maybe with a good relay protection countermeasure, this delay that we're introducing will be caught out and therefore this attack won't work. And there is one such uh, protection, some relay protection embedded in MasterCard protocols, and they have been standardized for a while now, but they're not deployed in the wild. As far as we know, we haven't found any such card in, uh, issued by a bank with relay protection. Okay, I will stop at, at this uh, slide and I will uh, then take questions in the last five minutes because I know that we started a bit later, but people will have to leave at four potentially and then I'll take questions and leave the formal side uh, for, for uh, later if anyone wants to, to hear offline. So in, in the summarizing slide in here, what I'd like to say is something about transport mode and what we found with the how we started, which was the uh, investigation of transport mode. And we found that those magic bytes at the beginning are only consumed by Apple. And the magic bytes was that series of transactions that with uh, a series of bytes that were happening before the NFC protocol even started. And that is actually uh, an um, a, a, a patent for a, by Apple, whereby Apple would consume this a byte to wake up certain uh, applications. When the mobile phone is locked, so the iPhone is locked, it will consume through the NFC interface this byte and will wake up different apps. So in this particular byte, wake up the Apple Pay, the wallet. But they, they have in this patent ways of waking up other things. And they would wake up things differently for different, even for the, uh, the pay. So it would be some bytes for transport for London and some bytes for buses. We also know that Apple Pay only speaks to, uh, to, to terminals and readers that are in that mode offline with, uh, for online. So where we have to, for example, in the attack flip, that TTQ part uh, of, uh, of the bytes of the bit, the bit in the TTQ that would say, I'm this type of transport terminal. And this is how Apple Pay works in transport way. Samsung, on the other hand, does not use the magic bytes. However, the, for, for Samsung, I could start an EMV transaction with a lock phone. So without any uh, unlocking of the, uh, the phone, without me putting a fingerprint on it, it, to any terminal, not just to transport for London, any terminal doesn't have to be in this mode. However, however, in that locked mode, it would only work with zero value payments. So that's how you could do uh, zero value payments in transport mode. They send zero and therefore it, it would work. We also know, I didn't describe the MasterCard protocol to you, I focused on Visa, that MasterCard consumes in the beginning, in the AMV protocol, the merchant category code, and it has to be a transport category code for the protocol to work in certain ways and to do a, pay, a transport payment with a MasterCard. And these are our findings, and this is the attack. And in the next, in the last minutes, I will just answer some questions, and then 
I will potentially um, say more things during the questions. Sorry for overrunning. Okay, uh, thank you, Yvonne, for the talk. Um, so I do see one participant has raised a hand. Uh, Budi, would you like to start with the question? Um, sure, I guess you can hear me. Yes. Okay, thank, thank you for the uh, very fascinating talk. Um, yeah, I, I agree with the massacre and FISA. When we used to do work on this, uh, we realized that uh, massacre would call us well in the middle of doing experiments, whereas FISA would just let us tinker with whatever we do with the card. Um, I wonder if, um, because you seem to have a bit close relationship with FISA, I wonder why FISA would not um, in, you know, impl implement or put in place these extra security measures um, uh, compared to MasterCard. Perhaps you have some insider knowledge on why they're sticking with you know, the way they operate for this long. Okay, so this is a slide on disclosure that I didn't get to. And by the way, during this question time, I don't know how they feel about it, but I invite every uh, one of my co-authors that is in this call, if they're there and they want to chip in, please uh, chip in and, and tell uh, your view of this. So we did the proper disclosure by the proper means to Apple, to Visa. They acknowledge these problems. But as on my slide in here, there was some apparent divide. So Apple wanted Visa to fix it and Visa, Visa wanted Apple to fix it, so to speak. Not exactly said like this, but this was the um, implication of the conversations that we believe were going on behind the scenes. Uh, we were told officially or unofficially some, some aspects like this. Unofficially, so not through, not through the disclosure procedure, but through our partner that is a, 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 the visa partner in the project in October this year, so you would see this is almost one year, more than one year since this started, we learned that visa is looking to fix the problem in a way that involves minimal costs. So minimal costs means I probably, you know, uh, what, what of these measures would be the cheapest to deploy in their backend uh, part of the network and catch this attack? That is one answer. And the other answer is that is a, is a risk management aspect. So um, I believe that if these attacks would, uh, this is my personal belief, would uh, start popping up everywhere, then they would be, uh, then they will uh, probably fix it more quickly. Uh, they did also tell us that fraud mechanisms uh, would, uh, fraud detection mechanisms would kick in at some point. They didn't kick in for us, even though we did many, 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 many transactions and they never came back and said this transaction is denied. And transactions above the limit and transactions that didn't fit our spending profile, a thousand pound transactions out of the blue on an ISETL. Um, and it never, ever ever stopped us. However, they did say that uh, potentially if this was happening at scale, uh, fraud detection mechanisms would kick in. Okay, thank you. That seems consistent. They seem to be, uh, well, we did responsible disclosure and all that as well. And they said, yes, we have something at the back end which will prevent this one if, if it was real. But yeah, anyway, I thought uh, there might be something more revealing. But well, it's, it's, it's cool that uh, it's happening. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is very real, by the way. You don't have to intervene with anything. I can buy an iZettle from anywhere and I can put any value on it and I can take your iPhone and, um, well, not take it, be close to you and do this relatively close to you, but take your iPhone, you have it locked, you have one of these uh, card and transport modes and then this would happen and this is very real. There's nothing, we didn't tamper with anything in here. So the iPhone is not tampered with, the terminal is not tampered with, it's just a normal terminal that anyone can buy. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank cool, you. thanks. Thank you, Buddy. So I think we can take one final question from David, because I think we're almost the limit. Hi, sorry. Yes, I was, I was wondering, of course, I know that Visa and MasterCard are the most popular ones, but I was wondering if this same analysis has been done or is expected to be done to another credit cards holder like American Express or one of the other kinds? Yes, this is a very good question. So as you see, this uh, this in here summarizes this. We've also looked at Google Pay, by the way, but it's not summarized in here. And Google Pay has a very different way of operating. I don't have time to cover this. And I know uh, that um, my colleagues, uh, Tom Chotia and Andrea Inaradu, they are looking at uh, American Express with a student, but I do not know particularly if in this context or not. In this research, we did not look at American Express. 
Um, if I can just jump in. Um, so American Express follow MasterCard extremely closely, uh, which given MasterCard's very good is a sensible thing to do. So MasterCard isn't vulnerable to this attack. So uh, American Express isn't vulnerable to this attack because they follow MasterCard. Yeah. Um, Google Pay, there are vulnerabilities of a very similar nature. They are vulnerabilities of a very similar nature. However, the way they process this information here, Google Pay has some logic here that no one else has. So when you send it this information, it will make it will try and match up the logic between what it receives from the terminal and what state the phone is in. So it will match up the state of the phone where it's unlocked and locked with the information from the terminal. So they would have some vulnerabilities, but their log their the way of consuming this information is different to uh, to um, what is this to uh, Samsung Pay and Apple Pay. It's it's matching up phone state phone state with information from them. Thank you. Okay, David. So initially I didn't think we had questions, but I see Pardeep has one more question and then we'll stop the recording. Okay. Let's see if Sia has any questions. Yeah. Pardeep, yeah, you can yeah, definitely ask one. Okay. I'm waiting. I'm just going to scroll up to the uh, disclosure site. Thank you, Noah, for nice presentation. Um, I have very, actually very simple question here. Uh, you have proposed your new protocol here, huh? Mm -hmm. We have a new protocol as well, yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, did you do actually some performance evaluation for your protocol, uh, especially for the um, uh, this uh, smart card actually? Yeah. Yes, we do. And uh, the, this protocol that, um, you're speaking about um, in here is a protocol that basically introduces at the um, EMV level, this is sorry, at the um, NF, um, NFC level, at the RFID level, introduces an exchange that wouldn't exist in there. So the only thing that changes in this protocol with respect to um, performances would be this exchange that happens at level one, at the NFC level. And this, ex this exchange is also timed. By the way, such a protocol with such an extent exists by MasterCard, but this, this sort of um, exchange is timed here in MasterCard at the EMV level. So because of relay protection security, we move that, if you want, at the um, um, RFID level and FC level in a way that back, it's backwards compatible with the protocol. So basically the protocol allows for extra communication like this. This is the only extra bit we add. And then we take this nonces and put them into the signature that the reader receives um, at the MV level, or if this was another application level, you could bind them in the application level in a different way. So this protocol is a protocol that in terms of, if you even look at it in terms of, in terms of um, complexity, efficiency, efficiency is really uh, with minute changes. And we did measure this and we do have some uh, measurements in, of timings and so forth, including how much the exchange takes and so on, the nonce generation takes. Um, and I do not know for a fact if it made it into a paper, into the paper that's online. And if it didn't, I can send you this evaluation. Oh, dear. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. 